I'm Stefan Durkom. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of African Economies. This week, we should have had our conference. The coronavirus thought differently. So as a result, we are trying to bring you a few of the panels and some of the presentation as part of our um, hashtag DIY CSAE uh, series on Twitter and other social media. So I'm very happy to be able to introduce three speakers to you that will contribute to a session that we had planned around current issues on research and policy of taxation in Africa. So the three speakers on this panel are each conducting research on issues to do with taxation. As you will notice later on, they do quite different research, but each has a relevance for developing countries and not least for sub-Saharan Africa. And each of them will have their own approach and their own experience in this field. So there are three people on this panel. Let me introduce them briefly in turn, and then we can start with brief presentations from each of the three of them. So first, we have Will Pritchett. Uh, so good afternoon, Will. Uh, good afternoon, Stefan. Uh, very good. It's very good that you can join us. Uh, Wilson is an associate professor at Munch School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. He's a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies and is the incoming CEO of the International Center for Tax and Development. Will's research focuses on the relationship between taxation and citizens' demands for improved governance and on the broader political economy challenges of effective tax reform, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa. He's the co-author of Taxing Africa, which was named a Foreign Affairs Best Book of 2019. And next, we will have uh, Dina Pomerantz. Good afternoon, Dina. Good afternoon, how are you? Uh, it's all well here for the time being. Um, Dina is uh, Assistant Professor of, at the Economics Department at the University of Zurich. As an economist, she's really well known for her research publishing on public policies in developing countries, and in particular in the areas of taxation and public procurement. And then finally, we have uh, Abebe Shimeles. Hi, Abebe. Hi, hello, Stefan, Dina, Wilson uh, uh, from Nairobi. So I'm happy to join this group. Thank you. Uh, Abebe is the director of research at the African Economic Research Consortium in Nairobi, and previously the manager of development of the Development Research Division at the African Development Bank. Well, I hope you're all keeping safe at the moment. Um, and thank you all three for joining me. These are different times for each of you to, uh, to do so. Uh, what I will let you do each is just introduce your work in five minutes, and then I will follow up with asking uh, a few questions. So first, uh, Wilson Pritchard, Will, please um, go ahead with uh, your brief introductory remarks. Uh, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for the introduction uh, and also for sort of pushing this ahead under the very difficult circumstances. Uh, in some ways, in my sort of capacity, uh, the kind of development, my research now is very broad in remit in that I'm really interested in looking at a broad level about what we have learned and what we can learn about uh, the effectiveness of African tax administration and tax policy and also areas for potential reform. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is to sort of make five broad points about what I think research has told us about uh, tax systems in Africa uh, and where research uh, may be leading uh, next. Uh, so the first point, I think it's an important but very basic point, is to say that I think research has made very clear that there's been really significant progress in strengthening tax systems across lower income countries, but particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, accompanied by the growth of regional organizations uh, that have built epistemic communities of tax experts, and which have helped also to support sort of deeper links between researchers and tax administration, which has sort of reinforced that learning. Uh, I think that's a really sort of important background message uh, to everything that follows. Um, and second, despite that, of course, I think there are a whole host of areas in which reform has made some progress, but not all of the progress that was promised. And I think research has helped to tell us a bit more about what have been the roots of those shortfalls. Uh, and so let me just flag a few of the ones that, that really catch my attention. Uh, I think one that always catches my attention is the severe undertaxation of wealthy individuals uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa and of course other parts of the Global South. I think this is partially about technical challenges of tracking investments and non-salary incomes uh, among this group, uh, including across borders internationally, uh, but it's also, of course, about the reluctance of political leaders uh, to tax uh, wealthy and influential individuals. 
Uh, I think similarly, we've seen that the VAT has become the workhorse of revenue generation around the world, uh, but it's also particularly ineffective in much of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I think you know, lots of research, uh, including uh, research that Dina's done, has really pointed to the particular importance of tracking VAT paper trails and the inability of low-income governments often to do that effectively. Um, we've seen a lot of research attention to the, to the complexity of taxing multinational companies uh, across borders, but particularly again in low-income countries where capacity to implement OECD rules is challenging. Uh, and I think IT reform has been a huge push of recent efforts, uh, but research increasingly is showing us that while IT reform has happened, often those systems are severely underutilized, implementation is imperfect, and so on, which has slowed reform. Uh, I think those are some of many areas in which you know, research is helping us to highlight areas where more is needed uh, and the nature of the challenges that we face. Uh, the third point, I think, though, is a general message about what research is telling us, and that is that very often those challenges are rooted in a failure of politics uh, and in models of taxation and tax administration drawn from the West that are not terribly well suited to the realities of low-income countries. Uh, and again, it's sort of some brief illustrations. You know, when we think about the taxation of elite groups, you know, evidently this is partly about politics and the absence of enforcement among these groups, and that's sort of transparently true. It's also about the difficulty of participating in international information sharing. Right, and the ways in which international rules are poorly suited to the realities of lower income administrations. Uh, similar things about property tax, right? Part of it is clearly about an absence of enforcement in the face of politics, but other parts of it are these complex systems imported from the West where simplified systems might work better in local contexts. Uh, and I think research is beginning to show us that. A third area is the absence of basic data sharing. Again, we talk about the failures of data management, but we haven't done as much research, but we're starting to about why that's the case, right? About the politics of tax administration and the absence of data sharing, but also about the complexity of the information systems we've tried to build and the ways in which simpler systems might work better in some contexts. Uh, likewise, when we think about taxing smaller and informal firms, we often think about these drives to register as many firms into the tax net as we can, because that's our sort of model internationally. But again, low-income countries, we find that model often doesn't work uh, quite as well, we need to perhaps begin thinking about suit suitable strategies in lower capacity environments. Um, the fourth thing I think uh, to flag that I think emerges out of research is that research is making progress on those fronts, right? Research is really beginning to capture those political constraints and the need for local specificity, specificity in how we think about policy and administrative solutions. But that's not necessarily translating, I think, into the way that reform is happening and capacity, capacity building is happening in practice in country, right? And so I think there's a real challenge there of translating research into practice. Uh, and again, some brief illustrations. You know, if we think about international tax reforms, uh, we know now very clearly that a key problem for low income countries of taxing international incomes and taxing multinational companies is that the rules that exist internationally are enormously hard to administer and to participate in in lower capacity environments. But yet, our international discussions and the technical assistance that flows from it has reinforced those very technocratic approaches that may not be very suitable locally. When we think about information technology systems, again, we're often importing very sophisticated systems wholesale, whereas maybe the data management problems that exist on the ground are more nuanced, more subtle, and require more targeted solutions. Uh, and I think research can do more to research those questions, but also to highlight them into the policy realm. Uh, the final thing, uh, and related to my earlier research, is you know, that ultimately interest in supporting expanded taxation is really premised on a belief that taxation will be translated into improved outcomes. Uh, and academic research tells us that expanded taxation can spark new political engagement and demand making and create greater pressure for governments to responsive, be responsive. In a sense, taxation can spur the construction of new fiscal contracts. And on balance, our research seems to say that on average, there is that potential. Right? But, in some sense, I think we've asked that research question. What we really need to look at now is under what circumstances are we more likely to see expanded taxation translated into stronger popular demands and stronger fiscal contracts? And I think there's a real opportunity for new research to fill that gap and tell us how concretely we can think not just about raising more revenue, but ensuring that it's translated into real benefits for taxpayers. You know, and in my research, I think I've sort of touched the tip of the iceberg there focusing on how do you increase the political salience of taxation and public debate, including focusing on direct taxes? How do you focus on ensuring horizontal equity, that is, that rich people also pay taxes and so have common cause with low-income taxpayers in bargaining with government over what they get in return? How do you expand transparency around revenue and budgeting to facilitate public engagement? 
how do you create spaces for public engagement? How do you strengthen civil society participation? You know, but those are big high level messages. I think the next phase for research is how can we drive deeper and really think concretely about how to strengthen popular engagement and therefore increase the benefits from taxation, not just revenue collection itself. Uh, so let me stop there. Uh, I hope that's a useful introduction. That's great, Will. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I definitely have a couple of comments uh, on this, but I'm going to wait for a moment. And I think I think I should let uh, first Dina come in. Um, you know, Dina, you, you have uh, a lot of experience researching issues on taxation and tax collection agencies for quite some time. Um, I would really be interested to hear a little bit about your research and, and how is this getting under the skin of tax authority, you know, digging deeper in terms of what is the relationship, um, relationships within tax authorities, how it relates to policy, how it links to citizens and firms. Anyway, I look forward to hearing uh, some first comments from you. Thank you very much and thank you so much for having me on this panel. Even though I started out my research more uh, in collaboration with tax authorities in Latin America, I recently also started to work uh, with the Kenya Revenue Authority and hope to expand more in the continent. Um, so I prepared some slides. Let me open these. Excellent. So as Will already pointed out, right, so uh, in many African countries, taxes as a share of GDP are quite low uh, compared to the rest of the world. This means, of course, that with lower GDP per person and then a smaller share of that being collected as taxes, there really is much less government revenue available for public infrastructure, uh, social services and so on. So that's why we all care so much about all this um, tax capacity and revenue mobilization. Now. This, um, this is, sorry, here we can see um, different countries as an example. On the top, you see France with a very high percentage of tax collected, tax as a share of GDP, uh, over 40%. Uh, United Kingdom is considerably lower, but still twice as high as, for example, Kenya. Some of the African countries like Zambia have actually reduced their share of tax collection as a share of GDP. Um, so you can see different countries have different trends. Uh, Mali, on the other hand, has increased a lot, almost doubled since 1983. What's in a way encouraging to know is that most rich countries, if not all, actually had an even lower share of tax revenue compared to GDP 100 years ago. Um, so it's a very recent phenomenon that rich countries have the capacity to raise so many taxes, so high taxes. Um, and so there's lots of hope that a similar trajectory can happen in other countries too, who are inspiring to having a higher capacity to collect taxes. The challenge of this domestic resource mobilization really, I think uh, Will has already mentioned uh, some of these, eh? we want to increase tax collection, but at the same time, so it should be effective, sure, and it relates to capacity and things. It should also be fair, big taxes, but my neighbors don't or the rich people don't or you know uh, um, a, a perception that is the system is not fair will really undermine tax morale then as will also pointed out should be progressive right now we actually see that in some african countries even regressive so that the poor pay a higher percent in taxes because they have to pay the value added and so on and as will uh, alluded to that some of the rich individuals can really escape a lot of the taxation which is a problem for fairness but it's also a problem for poverty reduction, right? So we want to actually, the reason we want to have resource mobilization is to help also poverty reduction, poverty alleviation in the countries, but if we're burdening mostly the weakest or the poorest, actually get, that can really backfire. So we want to limit the negative impact both on business growth and on poverty reduction while expanding the tax net. Um, so I personally have obviously only worked on a small <laughs> subset of these questions, I started with the Chilean Tax Authority in 2008, and then I started working with the Ecuadorian Tax Authority more recently, with the Kenya Revenue Authority. And as I mentioned, I hope to expand uh, more into other countries. Um, and I, the type of methods I use is both randomized controlled trials, but also working with existing data um, to analyze in, um, interventions that the tax authorities did and see how effective they were at boosting tax compliance. I'll give you a few examples. So in Chile, the Tax Authority Servicio de Impuestos Internos sent 100,000 letters to randomly chosen firms 
uh, with special messages that allowed us to study the intricacy of the value added tax. And we found that the paper trail in the value added tax, when I asked for a receipt from my supplier, that actually now in my books, there's proof that my supplier made a sale, that paper trail actually helps in tax collection. So great, right? But then we went to Ecuador and we analyzed the program that the Ecuadorian government had implemented, trying to start to cross check all these paper trails. It's exactly the stage where many African countries are. We have this information, but now how do we make it sync? And Ecuador acquired that capacity. It's really challenging. And they had very high hopes and to some degree it worked, but to a lot big degree it was disappointing. Namely, what happened? They sent out notifications to firms, informing them there was a big discrepancy between the sales they had declared and the sales they knew that the government knew they had because of these third party paper trails. And two things happened. First, a large part of the firms did not respond to the letter. And those who did actually also increased their declared costs. So the actual tax collection didn't go up that much. So from that, we learned that even in a quite high capacity country like Ecuador, just paper trails alone is not enough. You need to have the deterrence power and the capacity to follow up on these with the threat of real audits, such that people are actually afraid then they get that kind of letter. Okay, and then finally, ongoing work with the Kenya Revenue Authority. We're, doing, we're working on a randomized trial to study how can government best collect outstanding tax debt by firm, such that firms are actually able to pay it if they are liquidity constrained. So that's the type of things I'm working on. And here's a couple of things I learned that I think are important when embarking in this type of collaborations, if people maybe are listening or thinking of having those kinds of collaborations. So one of the things that I think is great that we can offer as researchers is real long-term deep mutual learning partnerships. We don't fly in for three days, dispense advice and leave, but we can actually really have this mutual learning where I learned so much from these experts in the tax administration. Where are the real day-to-day -day problems? And we can teach them maybe methods and there's, you know, as I said, I have worked with some of these people for over 10 years um, and that's really great. And I think there's much more learning and can go on because we as researchers, the downside of research as academics is we are slow, but the upside is we have time. Um, then the second key thing is it's important to find research topics that really are of mutual interest to create win-win situations. Not that I come in as a researcher and say here, here's what you should study. It's we are having this whole process of finding out what are things that are interesting for tax administration. At the same time, they're interesting for international learnings that are relevant for academic research. So that gives the tax authority well, free labor. Uh, me and my team will work for them for free um, for quite a while if, if we have a topic of mutual interest. There will be international lessons learned that can also help the reputation of the tax authority because now other countries can learn from their success. And oftentimes within those studies, we actually collect more revenue. So, so it can be very beneficial. And my experience has been there are extremely smart and highly motivated people working within tax authorities. Well, as economists, we're kind of nerds. And a lot of tax officials are also kind of nerds. And we match well. So I have really great relationships and I really enjoy those. So for those of you who are interested in more specific advice of that kind of nature, uh, Jose Villabelda and I actually collected lessons learned and advice from other researchers who work with tax authority um, that we summarized in this uh, last year's paper on called Taking Tax Capacity Research to the Field. In the last section of the paper, you can find much more advice that I obviously cannot summarize now within five minutes intro. So that's my spiel. Thank you, Dina, for this uh, brief introduction. And uh, there I see a slight pitch for some uh, more work uh, with African tax authorities, if possible. And Absolutely. that's uh, definitely very important. And I think uh, this is a good moment to also uh, go to Abebe Shimedes. Um, Abebe, I know you've actually done some work in recent years with uh, tax authorities and around tax collection as well. Um, so tell us, tell us a little bit about your experience in this, this area and how you think about it at the moment. Um, it's good to be in this panel and thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, both Wilson and Dina um, identified the most important challenges that Africa faces uh, in mobilizing taxes. Uh, they have been looked at both the political economy as well as the technical uh, and policy issues uh, many governments are grappling today. Likewise, I've also done a bit of work in this area 
Uh, just to uh, elaborate a bit, uh, one of the things, at least, uh, as uh, Dina mentioned, the uh, tax to GDP ratio in most African countries is low. But more than that, the tax efforts itself uh, is significantly low. And uh, there is a, at least an indication uh, in countries where such efforts are very low, the correlation with external debt seems to be very strong, which suggests the possibility that most African countries rely on external resources to finance the development. And it doesn't have uh, uh, a sustainability and also efficiency uh, aspect when you think of uh, domestic resource, the role of domestic resource mobilization in achieving uh, economic transformation. In that regard, some of the research and uh, work I've done include um, the issues of uh, institutional uh, dimensions, such as trust that people have on the uh, government authorities regarding tax. So there is a paper uh, we did based on the Afrobarometer data set about corruption and uh, tax compliance in Africa. And then there is a bit of micro work I've done in Ethiopia, which uh, actually looks at uh, precisely this aspect of uh, what is the size of tax evasion? Uh, what are the best ways of dealing with uh, tax payers in terms of understanding their behavior? Uh, fairness, uh, trust, um, persuasion, audit, all. Uh, this combined, uh, how does a tax authority can define uh, a much uh, smarter approach to work with uh, taxpayers? And then, of course, there is the issue of equity. Uh, I've done also a bit of work on fiscal incidents in countries such as Tunisia, which try to capture uh, who carries the burden of uh, tax uh, and how the benefits of some of the subsidies go to uh, the population. And then uh, we find a lot of holes in uh, which, which require the attention of governments. Now, um, in this context, I would like to just talk a little bit more about the uh, experience I've had in Ethiopia, which takes me back again to Dina's point about uh, tax uh, people, experts working in tax revenue authorities. Uh, can guide us in terms of uh, the real r policy questions, challenges they have. This is exactly what happened to us for in Ethiopia. It, in conversation with the tax authorities over the last five years, and that conversation actually led to a few um, uh, interesting studies. Uh, one of them is, as uh, some of you may know, uh, the Ethiopian government uh, has been uh, undertaking significant reforms uh, since the mid-2000s. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, initiatives were introduced, including the introduction of information technology to at least assist uh, to gather information about tax payments, especially VAT. But also it has uh, introduced several other reforms to, to strengthen the revenue authority uh, with respect to capacity. So we had this, what you call natural experiment, to evaluate the impact of all those efforts. In the course of doing that, uh, the revenue authority actually, basically the people there asked us, our interest is not for you to evaluate for us whether the cash register system, which is a, a, a unique uh, 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 instrument, they allowed to be installed all over Ethiopia businesses. We're based in the Revenue Authority, and that information is supposed to help the Revenue Authority uh, monitor uh, sales transactions, especially in the collection of VAT. In that context, uh, that paper, even though it was uh, received very well by them because the impact uh, which we identified was significant, they were more interested to understand what kind of relationship can it work with the taxpayers? Is this 
tax moral? Is it a threat of audit? I mean, they, they were grappling with these issues because the Ethiopian government introduced several incentives uh, to taxpayers, uh, especially for the compliant ones, so that people can learn from them and also bring into the tax fold the informal sector, small businesses. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, the tax authorities were uh, keen to understand uh, whether uh, persuasion works, whether uh, appeal to civil duty is interesting. So with that, uh, we designed a randomized experiment and linked it with administrative data and tried to uh, introduce elements of uh, serious threat of audits, as well as also very nice letters of persuasion. Uh, but also we had a control group, so about 5,000 businesses in Addis were uh, invited or uh, to, to go through this experiment. Uh, we worked very well with the Ethiopian Revenue Authorities uh, so that none of this uh, um, uh, exercise uh, was leaked to the public, so it was not contaminated. Uh, so we had uh, been fortunate uh, in terms of uh, uh, support uh, and and closer uh, uh, assistance uh, by the revenue authorities in Ethiopia. So the results basically uh, indicate a substantial tax evasion in Ethiopia, which in itself is not surprising, but at least it gives them the order of magnitude. And then also, which types of business tend to uh, to to uh, uh, evade taxes more frequently. And also, I mean, there are a number of uh, fine details that we have uh, uh, brought out from these studies. Uh, but basically, I think in conclusion, I would like to say uh, the institutional political economy factors tend to be very, very significant when it comes to Africa. And my belief is that uh, with the right approach, especially uh, transparency, fairness, uh, and also removing this perception of uh, corruption from the mind of the public is a very, very important step revenue authorities need to take. Uh, some of the ideas, for instance, we have floated around with the Ethiopian authorities is that why don't we make the revenue authority an independent body uh, administered by an independent board so that people have more confidence run by professionals and free of political uh, appointments, etc. Uh, well, that is very extreme, but I think uh, a very good possibility. So we can talk more about it, um, I think, in due course. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Abebe. That was uh, really good. Can I ask you very quickly to, to clarify, in the end, did persuasion or audit trails have bigger impacts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, thanks, Stephen. Uh, both of them had uh, significant impact. I, Actually, uh, more than you could find even in other similar studies uh, that were undertaken in other countries, we had 40% increase uh, for the threat of audit and 32% increase for the threat of uh, for persuasion. Uh, when we discussed this finding with the revenue authorities, of course, they were saying, I mean, uh, don't be too happy at this point. Partly the persuasion may have also captured an underlying you know, um, perception by, by many businesses that now they are under the radar of the revenue authority. So they may have complied uh, partly because now, okay, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, revenue authority is really uh, on to me. Uh, I mean, just to give you a little background because no, Ethiopian business had ever received a letter from revenue authority until that point in the experiment. That's why probably we got a very, very uh, significant response or behavioral change from the uh, businesses. Uh, it was unusual, unprecedented, and also very well kept uh, experiment. Uh, so per both persuasion and um, uh, threat of audit seemed to work, and we went back and again resurveyed uh, the uh, uh, businesses under this experiment, 
and all came back to the same point where we had started. So basically it shows the experiment uh, had that short-term effect, but then the businesses uh, really realized probably this was not a credible uh, effort by the revenue authority. So the, the, there was no difference, statistically speaking, among the three groups uh, who were um, in our experiment. Very good. That, that's very helpful, uh, Abebe, and, and uh, a lesson that we seem to be learning from other studies as well, and also from quite a lot of behavioral economics nudges as well, at times as well. So that's, that's very interesting. Um, I think, um, no, I, I, I have a question here. When I listen to all three of you, and maybe Dina could be the first one to, to respond to this, is that, you know, we, we get very happy tax authorities, so to speak, to work with. They're very delighted to work because they're all under pressure to collect more. And the one thing I was in fact in Ethiopia only not, not so long ago, um, everybody is focused on, we need to get more revenue. We need to get more, more revenue. And at least with debt positions in Africa getting worse, you know, we need more revenue. So they all, you know, anything, any help is welcome. Now, one of the worries I have when we get this narrow focus on, on the collection of taxes is that the primacy of policy, of tax policy over tax collection seems to get lost. You know, we can always say, surely it must be part of a big policy uh, yeah. thing, but all our, and, and are we as researchers helping that view is probably my question to Dina. And tell me a bit of how you think in your experience on this balance between policy and um, tax policy and tax collection. And anything else you want to comment on from anything you've heard, Dina, uh, maybe uh, you can start with the next round of comments. Just to clarify, by tax policy, you mean things like tax rates and type of taxes like that? Exactly. Or? I, I mean things like um, who should pay it? Should we go after people who are not yet paying or shall we do all VAT for all the business that's already formalized? And, you know, the kind of shall we go for the easy targets, any revenue is good, or should we try to go for, for more uh, systematically uh, balanced increases in tax collection? Yes, I, it's a good question. I, first of all, I want to say just, I think tax administration in low and middle income countries is tax policy to a large degree also. I think in, you know, in rich countries, you often think, okay, tax policy is to create a new law, the tax on the book, and then it happens automatically. And I think in low middle income countries, that's a big part of the tax policy is also how do we administrate it. But that said, um, I do think you're bringing up an important point about the issues that I mentioned also about progressivity and things like that. And I think one reason, this personally, I have been reluctant a bit to get into that is that it obviously gets very, very much into politics how should society be organized, what is justice, and so on. And me as a foreigner coming in there, like, I'm much more reluctant than, you know, let me help you help people follow the law. <laughs> Seems more natural, neutral. But I guess I think that leads me to another point, which is a really important concern that I have, which is also reflected on this panel, right? That here we are, three white people and one African talking about African taxes. And that's just something that, in my opinion, is not a sustainable thing. It's very neo-colonial not how these things should be. And if we had more teams that actually had lots of economists from the country, maybe joining with foreigners like myself, then I would feel probably less awkward to also get more involved and have the, if you're the Kenyans in Kenya talk to these issues more um, together. Um, I think those would be important questions, but we also have to work on our own structure from the academic economist community that we are not so much like a, a foreign invasion. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, I think it's more not, opens even more questions than answering the question you had, but I think it's, a, it's really important what you raised that we shouldn't just focus on enforcement. One thing that I think we can do as researchers and what I hope to do a little bit in my new research is also to look a bit, what are the economic impacts of tax enforcement? So if we're doing this and if you're now collecting debt or we're doing VAT cross checks and if it works and people do pay more taxes, what does that do to the firms? Do they have to let go people? Are people going to be hungry? Is, is it going to be really damaging? Or no, actually, they, you know, these medium-sized businesses can smooth it and it's fine. I think that's one ingredient we need to know in order to decide how to have tax policy. And that's the part where I, I think I would still feel comfortable myself because I'm not taking a position either way, but I can provide some evidence of what the impact of different taxes may be in practice. 
Thank you, Dina. Um, Wilson, would you like to uh, come in on this as well? And maybe and actually, I would love to hear Abebe's uh, response also to how you know, as an African uh, researcher, you know how you perceive this mass of white people flying in and just dispensing advice. Okay, I okay. Let, let, I'm happy to do that. So, so Abebe, do you want to come? Do you want to come back on this point that uh, Dina raises just now? Uh, Okay, I think um, maybe let me, if you allow me just a few minutes uh, to pick up on your question as well as also touch on uh, the issues uh, Dina mentioned. Um, starting with Dina's point, um, when, when you are on the ground here uh, in different countries, um, uh, obviously the, the challenge of uh, both collection as well as tax policy uh, seem to be uh, at a play uh, and as a result uh, tax authorities are not shy to tell you uh, yes uh, they have political economy issues um, i mean they are reported uh, on the media uh, at least uh, here in for instance kenya um, uh, anti-corruption groups, for instance, uh, and uh, uh, NGOs, for instance, uh, human rights uh, groups, uh, and other oversight institutions uh, tell their part of the story about the deep corruption and the flows in the uh, tax administration. But more than that, even the governments, I mean, I have spoke, I mean, I have worked with several African governments and I can tell you they are not shy about um, the depths of uh, political economy issues in affecting uh, their reforms, especially in improving uh, tax mobilization, but also uh, looking at tax policies in terms of making it optimal, because we know taxes are distortionary one way or the other. Um, so, that, so what... Um, uh, economic principle tells us is you have two dimensions to take care of. One is the efficiency and the other is uh, uh, the uh, equity side. So taxes are basically meant to, to balance these two social objectives. So in Africa, partly failure on the part of governments to communicate well with the taxpayers and the public, uh, such as for instance, uh, when it comes to social protection, you know, pe generally people don't feel uh, very much attached to their government that they don't feel they care for them, they don't feel they provide for them, uh, and still demand from governments uh, all kinds of, you know, rightfully public services. But on the other hand, uh, government's spending, when you look at it also, doesn't even consider equity as a matter of a guiding principle for them. So urban areas tend to benefit more than rural areas, for instance, from uh, uh, just public expenditure system. Poor people generally tend to bear the uh, heavy burden of the taxes. So in those areas, economists should not shy away uh, in terms of advising governments what is the optimal tax structure they need to have in place. When it comes to administration, uh, Dina, I think in this, uh, we are all together in it. Uh, this is how I believe. Uh, yes, um, uh, people from the uh, other part, I mean, if I go to Belgium and try to advise the governments, and if they find I have something decent and nice and uh, useful to say, I'm sure they'll listen. Um, so, so uh, uh, it, it is important to involve a, a lot of African researchers uh, to do the work. But as you know, also some of the work is very expensive. Um, uh, for me, for instance, I've had the privilege of using uh, African Development Bank as a platform to uh, finance uh, most of the research we have done. And I hope in future, uh, Dina is really to have, to forge um, a very good collaboration between African and also uh, others who are working like you and Stefan and Wilson uh, to work very much together. Uh, so that the voice, uh, I mean, for me, the most important is, are we uh, 
giving the right voice uh, to the right uh, people. Uh, just to give you, uh, I don't want to take too much time, but just to give you an example in Ethiopia, I know citizens want to comply. This is from the surveys that we have done. Afrobarometer also has shown very, very well that people want to comply. But they fear if they pay taxes and other people don't pay taxes, it's, it's not right. Which means basically even businesses feel that uh, they will be out of competition because it affects, as I said, it's distortionary. So it affects your productivity and your competitiveness in the, in the market. So uh, in Ethiopia, manufacturing is not evolving very well because the taxman's eye is on you. You have all the, uh, but then trade and wholesale and all this uh, services sector are able to easily uh, evade taxes. Anyway, I, I, I don't know if I have answered uh, the question, Stephen. Uh, I, think, I think you have. Thank you, Abebe. And I think I want to turn to Will as well to get some comments on this balance between policy, tax policy, tax collection, but anything else you want to add. And, and in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you also, Will, to, to reflect a little bit, you know, where, where is research? Where, where, what's the next frontier from as far as uh, you see for research in, in this area? So, Will, over to you. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Stefan. And, uh, and certainly echoing the others on the sort of, you know, the absolute primacy, I think, of, you know, collaborative research with researchers in country um, and, and making sure that that's a priority in everything we do. And certainly, you know, with the ICTV, a big part of our work has been investments in capacity building in trying to sort of raise local voices, collaborating with local authorities, putting in place uh, sort of particular ways of working in collaboration effectively with local researchers and so on. Um, but to, to get to your point, um, the, I think on the question of policy and administration, I mean, my, my answer is much like Dina's in that, uh, and I guess we're both sort of, you know, acolytes of, of Richard Byrd in some ways. So, uh, you know, this idea that, you know, tax, tax administration really is tax policy. Uh, and that, you know, it, I think in, in most of Africa, certainly the reality is that what's written on paper often has very little relation to what's happening in practice. Um, and, and so I think, you know, the key questions to me in research really are there for necessarily about administration. Um, but I think you're right that the key here is that we avoid sort of getting into a world in which then the task is just let's collect whatever we can as quickly as we can and ask, well, in what particular ways is the weakness of administration distorting who pays tax and who doesn't, right? And, and, and how can we make that better? Uh, and there's sort of two sides to doing that, um, speaking on my feet. I mean, one is at the level of policy, right? Asking the question, I think a key tax policy question in lower capacity environments is, can this policy actually be administered? Um, I think for African countries, that's been an enormous challenge in that I think there's a lot of policy on the books and certainly there's a tax rule, which has to be compatible with capacity on the ground, right? And so rather than asking, how can we build administrative capacity to implement very complicated policy, we need to be asking, how can we reform policy to make it more compatible with the realities of administration? Um, and so I, and I suppose in terms of research, I think that's an important, a really important direction of research in relation to property tax, in relation to taxing wealthy individuals, in relation to international tax reforms uh, and the like. I think the second part of it is, is really trying to get our head around at the level of administration, what's actually happening, right? Who's actually paying and who isn't paying? So that we can think concretely about the distributional impacts of taxation, about the equity impacts of taxation, and about where reform should be focused. And I think some illustrations of that um, from recent research, uh, mostly not my own, but research coming out of the ICTD, you know, it, with, with respect to high income individuals, um, it's very hard to research that question because it's political and therefore data is hard to come by. Um, but by virtue of some very close collaboration and trusting collaboration with authorities in Uganda and Rwanda, we've able, been able to do research asking who's actually paying income taxes, right? Uh, and what you get, and this is now published work, shows us the huge range of people who are outside the tax net and who are easily identifiable, right? But that immediately helps us to focus on really the real problem, is, which is how do you identify those people and how do you bring them into the net, recognizing political constraints? Uh, and at the far other end of the spectrum, um, you know, I think there's been a tendency in, in discussions around taxation in lower income countries to say low income people don't pay very much tax, uh, other than perhaps indirect taxes. Because if you look at national tax accounts, they don't. Um, but I think if you're on the ground, you realize that actually local people pay a lot of sort of things that look like taxes to local authorities in particular. 
And so we've done a lot of research trying to ask, well, what does administration really look like on the front line from the perspective of your average relatively low income taxpayer? Right? And what you find is those people pay a lot and they may not be taxes in the formal sort of definitional sense, but they're paying huge amounts into user fees, in informal payments to government officials, in contributions to community provision of services, into market fees and other kinds of fees. Put that all together and the burdens on low income people are enormous. But it's all, but you don't see that at the policy level, you see that at the level of administration. And once you see that, you can then think differently about both what policy reform is needed and what administrative reform is needed. Um, so, so again, I think in terms of research, like that, that effort of understanding, well, what exactly is happening concretely in practice? And making sure that our research is not just speaking to sort of questions as they appear on paper, but to the real constraints on improved outcomes, you know, at a ground level uh, becomes critical. And I think that's also what Pepe is doing. That's also what Dean is doing. Uh, but I think that's, that's sort of the key push uh, in my mind to research. And again, to summarize that point is, you know, thinking about can tax policy be administered? And if not, how can we think about better models? And to think about what's really happening in practice uh, at the level of administration often, and how do we close that gap, right? How do we make sure that actual outcomes are more equitable and then we're closing the most important gaps in practice uh, in trying to strengthen uh, tax systems. Uh, I'll stop there. Well, uh, thank you, thank you, Will. I think, you know, we are coming close to the end and I actually want to ask simply, maybe Dina and Abebe, each of you, you know, in one or two sentences, where do you think the frontier of research here is going to go uh, around uh, these issues of, of tax collection in the countries we're concerned with? So Dina, maybe. Uh, great. So I think I agree a lot with what uh, Will already listed. Um, one area that I'm very excited about, and I think we have neglected, is a little bit to go beyond the impact on tax collection to look at real effects. In the African context, I think it's really important to look at impact on poverty and the quality of life of the poorest, because a lot of this tax base expansion goes into, oh, let's register everyone. And then we are taxing people who, as Will said, may already be taxed a lot informally, uh, even more, while there are some rich individuals who really get away with it. Uh, I actually recently <laughs> ran into somebody at the airport in Nairobi who, who were waiting in line, and she was telling me how she's a descendant of a white colonial family, and her parents just are of the view that Kenya is a country where you don't have to pay tax, right? And that's really wrong when we're squeezing the poorest and this, this stuff still happens. So the equity part, the real impact, the impact on poverty, uh, I think are, are really understudied. Okay. And now, Bebe. Uh, okay, thank you, Stefan. I think um, if I am allowed to go back a little bit to what earlier I said, um, uh, having a tax administration body that is um, trustworthy, transparent, cannot be underestimated. I don't know what magic we can use to bring that to um, uh, to exist in many African countries. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So, so, so I think it's it's very important. The tax authority uh, is seen. Uh, favorably in the eyes of the public, the taxpayers, uh, when it comes to uh, fairness, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, proper uh, treatment of all taxpayers, etc. So uh, the potential for, for uh, uh, a sustainable and uh, highly uh, 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 efficient uh, mobilization scheme can be had if that institutional setup is uh, uh, exists. The other is apart from tax, there, there, you know, when a government also can mobilize the public towards a certain uh, commonly shared objectives, non-tax uh, means of mobilizing resources are also available. Uh, those have not been tried very well, but I think Ethiopia is one other. Uh, country, we can mention the uh, Renaissance Dam is so much for instance at the heart of people's mind and, and uh, uh, passion. Uh, I think up to now, I can say uh, they have, uh, the government has collected close to a billion or half a billion dollars. I can't just remember the exact figure uh, from the public 
um, and it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, resources. So uh, governments can uh, say decentralize. Take care of the policemen, the uh, school in my area, the health centers in my area. Probably I will be able to see for myself, uh, especially rich people, businesses, uh, will be, I think, willing to share a bit of their um, resources uh, to provide for uh, the public in their area. So social protection programs of different types, encouraging um, uh, well-to-do and uh, businesses to, to engage in charities is very, very, I think, important. Again, Ethiopia is seeing a lot of progress. Uh, we have now, you know, for the first time, uh, institutions that take care of elderly from the streets um, because Ethiopia doesn't have any uh, social protection program for the elderly and uh, for uh, unemployed, etc. Now you see private citizens uh, really participating and, and uh, mobilizing money. Recently, just uh, last week, they were able to raise close to, I think, four or five million dollars just for one uh, uh, charity. Uh, another area is, of course, um, I agree with Dina and again uh, with Wilson. Uh, when, when we look into uh, the long term, that is, I mean, uh, the whole issue of tax mobilization is about intertemporal maximization anyway, either by government, by citizens. Um, therefore, there has to be a vision of the future laid out with, where there is a bit of consensus. So most importantly, in, uh, in, in, in many African countries, uh, governments are a bit short-sighted when it comes to uh, the future and uh, what it costs today to get there. So in that regard, you don't see much of a communication about their future plans. Uh, oftentimes, those plans end up in parliament and then they are shelved. They are not told to the public say in four or five years time in your area, there will be some factories coming, some railway coming, some things come. So the, uh, we should be able to evaluate the impact of for instance, uh, governments with a bit of vision of the future compared to the others. Anyway, these are a few ideas for future research. Excellent. I want to thank you uh, uh, all three very much. So I, I would like to thank uh, Will, uh, Dina and Abebe for uh, the contribution to this discussion um, and um, I look forward to getting the chance to do this one more time in person in due course and for now I would say stay well and stay safe.